Our first honoree is Dickie Wells, and unfortunately, he is being inducted posthumously. But Dickie is a native Washingtonian, is one of the greatest centers to play at American University, and is one of only three players to have scored over 1,000 points and grabbed more than 1,000 rebounds in a career. He was recruited by Hall of Fame coach David Carrasco, and he became the first African-American to play at American University and also the first African-American to play in the Mason-Dixon Conference. He was a leader on three conference championship teams and was the first Eagles basketball player to be named an All-American. We're pleased today to be joined by three gentlemen who will present and accept Dickey's induction into the Hall of Fame, David Carrasco, Willie Jones, and Ed Wells. To begin is our honor to welcome David Carrasco to the podium. David's father, father, also named David Carrasco and known as Big Dave, Big Dave, great nickname, so was a head men's basketball coach at American from 1956 to 1962. It was Coach Carrasco's commitment to his players' overall personal development and to the cause of integration that led to Dickie Wells' enrollment at American University. Here to share his memories of that historic time is David Carrasco. On behalf of my family, and especially in the name of my father, Coach David Carrasco, I thank American University's Department of Athletics for this invitation to join in the celebration of the life and skills of Dickie Wells. For me, his induction into the AU's Athletic Hall of Fame is not only about the recognition of the athletic excellence of the man, it's also a moment of social justice, of social and educational justice. And it's especially good to be here with his brother and other members of his family who are witnesses to the living power of Dickie Wells's athletic ability and educational success. I want to say it's also an honor to be part of Coach Williams' induction into this Hall of Fame. Another member of the AU Athletic Hall of Fame, Coach Jim Williams, AU class of 1956, who was assistant basketball coach here when Dick Wells played, wrote and sent to me this week a very fine reminiscence of Dickie Wells that includes the following words. He tells of watching with Coach Carrasco a late summer informal scrimmage in Leonard Gym. And it was the first time that Williams saw Dickie Wells play. And this is what he says. Coach Carrasco and I stood in the doorway for about 20 minutes. And then we looked at each other and we both began to smile. We were watching Dickie Wells, Willie Jones, Eddie Clements, Ronnie Crown, Bill Beecham, Walt Dupie, Bill Sass, Ken Waller, Bill O'Brien, and we knew that here at AU the fun was about to begin. I heard someone yelling, Tree, get the ball. Tree, get the rebound. Tree, here comes the pass. Tree, pick up my man. And I realized that Willie was yelling out instructions to Dickie Wells, <laughs> who Willie had nicknamed Tree. I soon realized that defense was not Willie's number one priority. <laughs> Williams goes on. I spell this word Tree with capital letters because Dickie Wells was definitely as big as a tree. He was tall. He had broad shoulders. He was wide. He had a long reach. And he was strong. And he was graceful. I like very much 
that Willie called him tree. I like this symbol of tree, for I am a historian of religions, teaching at the Harvard University Divinity School, and I've studied sacred trees in all the world religions. <laughs> trees are sacred because they're very high, and they become associated with the sky. They're sacred because their roots go deep into the ground where the ancestors live. They're sacred because they also provide shade and protection. They're sacred because they bear fruit every year. And for me as a 10-year-old boy going to the gym and watching Dick Wells play, I looked at him and I thought, this man is a cosmic tree. <laughs> He was the force in the middle. And for us, those of us who knew him and watched him and loved him, he became a kind of axis, an axis mundi for the AU basketball team. He was the true center of the court. Now celebrating Dick Wells as a great basketball center ahead of his time here at AU, we must remember the exciting and dangerous times that he played in at AU. He stood tall with courage because the truth is, at that time, he was not just viewed by people as a tree. He was viewed as a black tree, a black tree in a white world. It's been said here a couple times today that he was the first black athlete to play basketball at AU, the first black to be in the Mason-Dixon Conference. There was more. Because I remember at that time, GW, Georgetown, Maryland, and Catholic U did not recruit, did not respect, did not value, did not tolerate African-American athletes on the public playing courts of their universities. So when you say that Dick Wells was number one, was the first, we have to acknowledge the kind of courage and risk that American University was taking at that time. He was a player of not only tremendous ability, he was a player of great courage. Early on, the president used the word intercollegiate. American universities involved in intercollegiate. Well, here at American University and in the city, they didn't want blacks to play intercollegiate. But Dick Wells came, along with Willie Jones and James Howell, and my father, a Mexican-American from the border. And they created an integrated team that was embraced by the white players. And they did things in this nation's capital in basketball and along the Mason-Dixon Conference that had never been done before. So Dick Wells was not only a big tree, he was here at the creation of a new type of basketball era in this town and at this university. He was a first. And he let his playing do the talking by his jumping, his leaping, his rebounding, his blocking. That did the talking. But his strength and his abilities sometimes inflamed other teams and crowds. I remember, I remember going over to Georgetown. And we were playing Georgetown with our African-American player, our integrated team. At that time, Georgetown was all white. Everybody in the stands on their side of the stadium was white. <laughs> and the referees were making these hometown calls. I saw them. They were making all the hometown calls, and they were against Dick Wells. He was getting pushed, and he was being called for the foul. You know, all that kind of stuff. And Dick Wells, he took it for a while. But then Dick Wells said, I had enough. And he started throwing elbows. He started throwing elbows back. And when he started throwing elbows, on that Georgetown court, I saw a riot ensued. I mean a riot. I don't just mean on the court. I mean the place emptied. People came out of the towns, and they were going to beat up Dick Wells and the team. And I remember this tremendous scene because I, I was only 11 years old and like a fool, I ran out in the middle and I realized, man, I'm too deep in this thing here. I better back off. But I looked over and I saw Dick Wells and my father, who was at the same side, standing back to back, throwing punches, <laughs> grabbing guys and pushing them out of the way. So it's very important to understand what basketball was like at that time. It was about social justice and duking it out, not only in terms of basketball, but in terms of this type of human situation. This was Dick Wells. There was always drama with Dick Wells. I remember at this time when this transformation was taking place that it was always a big moment, as there is in every basketball game, that tip-off. 
you know, the tip-off is always a kind of a dramatic thing. Well, with Dick Wells, it was a super dramatic thing because here was Dick Wells out in the center, and the other team had their white center. And we always knew Dick Wells was going to out-jump the guy. And when he out-jumped the guy and tipped the ball over to Jim Howe or over to Willie Jones and they scored, it was a moment of not only great beginning of a game, but it felt like a moment of social justice to us. And Dick Wells was a great, great leaper. I remember one time, one other time, show you how tough he was. Uh, there was a terrific basketball player at Quantico. And this guy could leap out of the gym. His name was Al Dillard. And Al Dillard was, a, he was an African-American guy. And he was playing with Marines. And Marines were always tough. And Quantico came over. You knew you were in for a real game. And so it was all set up that Dick Wells against, against Al Dillard. And down in, I remember down in the, in the gym, over by the stage part of Leonard Gymnasium, Dick Wells and Al Dillard went up for this, for this rebound, and they were at the top, top of their arch. And Dick Wells, not to be backed off, he threw the nastiest elbow right into Al Dillard's chest. And it was so loud, you could hear it at Mary Graydon Hall across <laughs> campus. You should know that from the middle of his first year, he was rated as one of the top five or ten rebounders in the NCAA college division until he left AU. It may come as a surprise, and I'm coming to the end of some of you, that in 1958, American University was recognized by the NCAA as one of the two most improved basketball teams in the whole country. My father received the George Mikan Award for coaching the most improved team in the country that year. There was one other university that got the award. I wonder if anybody knows what it was. It was the University of Cincinnati that had the big O, Oscar Robertson. But we had Big Dick Wells, and we had Willie, and we had Jim Howe. And that's a very important moment for American youth to embrace and to understand. We had Wells at the center, this big tree who was coming in to his own. In closing, my remarks of gratitude for Dick Wells should note that he also became a serious student in the classroom and worked hard to graduate and was proud of what he accomplished. Jim Williams, in this note to me, says, Dickie Wells became a great basketball player, but he also became a great student athlete. The American University provided this opportunity, and he took advantage of the opportunity to become all he was able to become in this short period of time. Martin Luther King said, especially for African Americans in this country, you had to be courageous of mind and caring of heart. And it seemed to me that that's what Dickie Wells was. Martin Luther King also said that in our educational and civil rights struggle, sometimes God shows that he has a mighty arm, and sometimes it bends toward justice. And I think that the American University Athletic Hall of Fame, in recognizing the excellence that was Richard Wells, has helped bend that arm of justice in Dick Wells' direction. And for that, I'm sure on the par part of the family and my family, we thank you and we applaud and we applaud, and we applaud Dickie Wells. Thank you.